Good evening, folks. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming in uh, 6 p.m. Monday night. You guys are all brave, I have to say that. Um, I'll talk about big data. What I want to do is, uh, I see a few familiar faces in my classes that I see. But for the rest of you, uh, I thought I'll just do a quick round of who I am. Um, I've lived and worked in uh, 13 countries, four continents uh, across the world. Um, like the professor mentioned, I am a computer. My undergrad is in computer science engineering. Uh, after my computer science engineering, I decided to work in the industry for a long time, for about seven years, um, across the world, different uh, clients. And then I went to this um, prestigious school called INSEAD uh, for my MBA program. We are in um, Fontainebleau, France, and in Singapore. Uh, we are ranked number one in international and internationally in the MBA programs. A 10-month intensive MBA program, I have to say, the best year of my life that I've had. Um, I came back from my 10-year reunion last year, so I'm a graduate of NCR 2007. Um, what I did after NCR was stayed in the tel telecom and uh, technology industry shifted the focus a little bit, but more or less I've spent most of my life with data. I love data, I love numbers. Um, a few of the clients that I've worked for, um, for example, uh, Apple um, at their world headquarters in um, California, Cisco again in California, um, Dun & Bradstreet was an interesting uh, example. Uh, some of you might know who they are, they are rating agency, they rate companies. Um, we did, what I did was I led their technology product launch in analytics. So we built a big data analytics product for their uh, large scale customers. When we say large scale customers, it's typically uh, UPS, FedEx, Coke, Pepsi. Uh, large in terms of volume of those um, revenue sizes of those customers, but typically the reports uh, that were coming out from our tool were about about a million records. And our um, when I pitched into the CTO about the product design for this product, um, the mandate was a million records in 20 seconds or less. So all of our reports were a million, at least they were all a million records and they used to come 18, 19 seconds would be like we are really stretching it, that's bad performance, but 12, 13 seconds. Um, we, I led that team across New Jersey, uh, Dublin, San Francisco, uh, Singapore, India. Um, those of you who are aware of project management and are learning agile methods, uh, think about a daily stand-up call at 5 a.m. every day for three straight months. Uh, so from design to product launch, three months flat out. Uh, it has been the most profitable and fastest ever product launch that DNB has ever done in their 150 years of history. Um, so did that. Sesame Street is close to my heart. Um, my husband and I have a nine-year-old daughter. Um, so she's gone through the Sesame rhythms. Um, it, it's amazing. Um, and as we talk through the presentation, I'll give you more insights and you'll be amazed how much information these companies actually capture out of you or out of even our kids um, as they're watching these. So I've done a lot of data analytics across industries, verticals, horizontals, you name it, and have done it. Um, that's who I am. Let's move on to the core topic of the day. We think big data, we talk big data, and this is like the hottest thing, and what's this cool thing? Everybody says big data. Um, let's realistically think, what is big data? If you look at the screen, what you see is, um, and this is slightly outdated, a um, year or year is short, so there's more data coming on, but it will still give you a perspective. This is the amount that comes at us every single minute of the day. It's not an hour, it's not a day. Every single minute that passes by, that's the amount of data that comes at us. A lot of us, or most of us, are on Facebook. Think about Facebook users like 4 million, 4.1 million posts every single minute. These are new posts. Uh, Twitter, YouTube users upload up to 300 hours of videos every single minute of the day. It's not even an hour. Um, what gets on interesting is Netflix 
we stream about 77,000 hours of video every single day. Uh, this is mostly US, we are not even expanding international right now. I know a lot of you are on Snapchat and Twitters and uh, that stuff, you can see your numbers. But that's the amount of data, amount of information that is out there on the internet every single minute of the day. Think about it. When we look at it from a communications point of view, I want you to start thinking a lot of that information is your information that's go that, that is going out every single minute. Right? right now, even if you have, whether you have your phones on silent, flipped, or you're uh, using your phones, it doesn't matter. As long as you have your phones and you have those apps, your data is getting transmitted every single second. Um, it does freak out a little, some people thinking what's going on and we'll talk about it, how much data does go out about us. But I always like to start with this perspective on why data is really important for us, right? A key thing when we think big data or data analytics, right? It does not matter what major you are in, whether you are tech, non-tech, the key three key things that successful organizations and good or good leaders always do, you always figure out what data do I need to measure, right? You can't just, there's so much of data here that you can go crazy trying to just figure out what data do I want to measure. But what successful people do or smart people uh, do is you figure out what is the data that I want to measure. Once I figure that, then the next step is how do I start monitoring this, these feeds? In tech terms, we call them feeds, which is like how do I, which are the feeds, which are the streams that I want to monitor? Do I want to monitor what's coming from Facebook and Twitter? Do I want to start monitoring Facebook, Twitter and email? You, you have your combinations and you say as an organization, what is it that I want to measure, right? The third step is when you start bolting some tools into it, saying, okay, I know what I want to measure, I know how that data will come in. The next step is, how do I start analyzing those that data? I've got tons of different types of data here. How do I bolt that data together? That's where you start using a lot of different tools, whether it's a simple programming to a um, market available tool that you can just embed into your organization. Those are the tools that you're using because at the end of the day, you're trying to see how can I generate some actionable insights? What action can I do? What step can I use? Can I do? Right? The, the, this is the crux. The rest is, okay, the grid work, the groundwork I got to lay out very well. At the end of the day, that's where your fruit is coming out to be, right? That is helping your organization much better. Let's look at what I thought of doing was, instead of explaining you what big data is going into technical terms, we'll go a little bit towards the end on that. I thought, first let's see what is, when we think of communications and when we think of big data, what does it, that really mean and how does that really connect together, right? Um, here's the thing, we are all using our devices, we have our Alexas and um, all, all the digital gadgets at home that are working for us or here, uh, series at work. What's at, is essentially what is happening for all of these companies, what are they telling us? They hear us every single second, they hear us every single moment of the day. Whether or not you're talking to the device, it does not matter. Right? Whether or not you have your phone, you're using your phone, does not matter. They hear you every single minute. A few different ways on how they're uh, accessing you. The first one, natural language processing. Anyone know, just avoid us, what is natural language processing? Okay, so here's natural language processing. We all go to Google, mm -hmm. right? In the Google search box, I'll probably, I'm a Patriots fan, so, uh, hardcore sports fan. Those of you who've been in my classes know that. Um, I'll just probably type uh, who are the Patriots playing against today. Right? I'm typing what my, I would think in my mind in the English language. If you're in another language, if you're in uh, Google Japan, you'll probably type it in Japan, whatever you want to type. That's basically natural language processing, which is basically 
teaching the computer how to understand a human language and converting it into a specific output that you, you want. Mm -hmm. Right? Our brains understand. When we talk, when I'm talking, your brain understands what I'm talking. The computer doesn't understand, but how do I make it understand? And that is all that Siri does that for you. You press the Siri button and you say, Siri, what is the weather like today? What is Siri doing at that point of time? Siri is taking your voice recognition. That means the modulations in your voice, in your communication. I believe in your talking or presentation style, you talk about the voice modulations. So that is what we are training the computers to do. How to understand human modulations, voice modulations. We train them how to understand different accents. Right? and stresses on different vowels and then process it into an output, give me an output that I can, I really need without me trying to do something, anything technical. Right? That's natural language processing. That's one way that these gadgets are listening to us. The other ones, um, entertainment options. Yes, these gadgets are also serving to us as an entertainment option. You can tell Siri, hey, play this song for me or tell Alexa to do something, play some song for you, right? You can do that. And we see those ads coming on to on the TV as well now. But realistically, what is happening when you tell Alexa to play a song for you? Alexa plays the song. What else? Um, she's processing like, the song you want to play and what music you might like. What music um, do I like? Exactly. She's Alexa, Alexa or Amazon in terms is actually getting to know my profile. Mm -hmm. Amazon starts to know this is what this person likes, this is what this person does not like. If you really want to start going deeper and if you combine natural language processing and serve entertainment options, they can actually start working on, if you have a certain, so in the house let's say there are two people, two people have different voice uh, modulations they can actually go to the next level saying, oh, I think the person with this kind of vo voice modulation has X amount, X preferences, and the other person has different pre preferences. Yes? Who's the they you speak of? Um, you say they can look at it, who's they? Um, Amazon or the company. Oh, that the company. So if you're Siri, then it's Apple. Apple has all of what, your information. What department? Is it like the coding and the developers, or is it more marketing? Um, it's the artificial intelligence or data science department of them. But that actually translates, it's, uh, that information does not stay just with the data science department, right? They connect it back to marketing, they connect it back to your communications and PR, they connect it to all the channels. Because here's how our, our world has gotten super connected, right? I know I have a Facebook profile and because I have, um, say, I must have liked an app of Siri or Alexa, I must have liked something on uh, on my Facebook that tells links them into telling, okay, you have that Alexa at home, right? And now I also have Alexa, and these companies exchange data. They can buy and sell this limited amount of data, but they do. Th the companies do that. So now they are getting into PR and communications. If I'm Amazon, and if I know you like certain types of information. Can I start sending certain types of ads on your Facebook feed? Mm -hmm. I can do that because I know your profile. Mm -hmm. It starts getting much deeper if we talk PR. The way that they are starting to know us as customers is at a much different level than what they knew about us 10 years ago when we were not using these connected devices so much. It is, what I'm trying to say is, it is so much of a connected world within, so, you think of it as communication, but it actually ends up winding across. It's a cobweb nowadays that they can swing through PR, marketing, every single layer that they want to go into. Right? And it can also go into product development because based on the preferences, they can start figuring out, if you like my company, what kind of products do you certainly like? What kind do you not like? Now I can go back to my product development and design people and say, no, maybe I've got a customer, I've got these type of customer profiles that like a certain type of product, let me go and can you guys develop a product for them, right? So it just goes across. Online shopping, again, these devices we are using for online shopping, whether you do it through your phone, you tell Alexa to buy something for you, you do it through your 
um, I log into my Mac and do it or iPad. It's the same Amazon login that I'm logged on to everywhere. So they pretty much, uh, the company pretty much knows what login, that's one part, what device, what geographical locations, time, time of the day, what kind of products. They actually can start going deeper. If I'm on my Mac, I'm buying a certain type of products and listening to a certain type of songs versus when I'm on my phone. Mm -hmm. right. Yes? Uh, say uh, for an Amazon account that it's shared from a family, does it tell my device what uh, person likes what like preferences products? Say like my younger brother buys uh, equipment for his sports games, but I buy video games. Would it uh, direct like show him athletes uh, products versus like showing me like stuff for games? They do that. Uh, I mean, Amazon will do it to some level, but within Amazon, they, they Amazon has pr pretty much tracked out that uh, your brother. There's that's a different device that's coming in from. Amazon has pretty much tracked that out that there's a different profile that's coming in into this uh, place, right? And through the app in that was installed, they can get some level of user information already. That yes, the ID is the shared ID, but you know there's a different there's two levels of profiles that are going there. Yeah. Um, controlling our homes at at a certain level, they're actually starting to controlling our home. Uh, on what we do. When we talk about controlling our home, we can also start talking about Nest and Google Nest and other things where you are controlling what you are doing from where you are sitting. You could be con changing the temperature of your house on, in Cape Cod sitting here right now. Right? So there is a lot of connectivity that is going on. Basically, in a nutshell to say that these companies know everything they kind of frame it, oh, we are listening to our customers so we can adapt much better, right? In effect, what they are doing is these companies are listening. They know almost, they can track your movements uh, pretty well down. What that means, if you are a marketer, you know how to sell directly, you know your customer behavior. I wrote marketer, but technically you could go across a PR. The PR can figure out what's the right message to give out, what what is the right time to give out, send out that message. Right? And they cannot. They have so much of data that they can figure out the right time, right device, right format, right style to send out that messaging. The next thing that we are actually tr trying to be sold on with most of these um, Internet of Things devices, IoT, which we call IoT. The IoT devices, what's happening is, every single time we install an app, what happens? You actually get to customize it for yourself. And we feel very good about ourselves as customers. Oh, you know, my app is different than yours because I've customized it, I've entered my data. Yeah, thanks for entering that data. <laughs> That's what actually the company is telling you, right? You're sharing your company, the personal information, we can argue that yes, credit card information does not hopefully get shared. We'll stay on the hopeful part um, because we'll talk about a few things uh, down the line. And what happens is all of this data is shared with the company, right? So if you've in, installed a Fitbit app, for example, all of this data is shared with the with Fitbit, right? They exactly know where you're moving, what's going on. But then the caveat is and partners. The company can technically share that data, share it or sell it, one of the two or both, with their partners. By partners, what we mean is it could be another company, it could be another subsidiary. And that is where it starts getting a little crazy. Stay with me on this thought, stay, share with the company and partners. We'll get to two interesting examples that we've seen in the last one in the last year, one in the last one week. What should we do then? What should the companies do from a communications point of view? Like, okay, there's so much of so much stuff going on. What do I do over there? Like, how do I? Because as customers now, we are saying that hey, that doesn't make sense. You're getting a ton of information from me, right? What should we do here? You've got to have a communications plan. All of this. But before we get to that, I want you to, I want us to just review, we'll get back to building, how do we build trust, but I want us to look at two examples. Hopefully, a lot of us have heard about Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, no. anyone know what that was all about? Yeah. What was that about? Okay. Say, yes, Is you it got targeting, it targeting yeah. ads for people in, for political uh, groups? How can I say? Usually they, they wanted to uh, gener uh, like send information that are, let's say, incorrect and they were targeting specifically the right people for that and they that's why they tip the political cycle or political process. Yes, you're pretty much uh, on the money for that. What happened was there was this company, Cambridge Analytica, right? Um, on Facebook, you have so many different lights, right? There are posts coming through all, 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 all through the day on our Facebook feed and we keep liking something or dislike or give our expressions on those. What Cambridge Analytica started doing was, they said, hey, we could actually collect that data about user profile. What are you liking? What are you not liking? And that combined with some level of personal information, which Facebook disagrees, but the rest of the world agrees that that was shared. If you combine that information about what posts you like, what you did not like, with what in, with your a little bit of your personal profile, what Cambridge Analytica, Analytica started building on is algorithms. Algorithms is nothing but a sequence of pro programs, right? Which are sequence of steps. So these algorithms or programs started knowing if you like something and if you're from a different geography, maybe your political inclination is towards a certain thing, right? And they were able to harness tons, millions of people like that. And now if I know that profile, if I send you a particular ad, either which, whether it's um, the blue party or the red party, it doesn't matter. But if I know what kind of profile you are, uh, and I have done analysis on it, and if I send you that ad, there is, a, in, there is an increased likelihood that you will gear more towards that party. It, I won't bore you with a lot of the details. Um, uh, I think Washington Post had shared like a 31 page um, thing about what actually happened. A quick thing about in that interesting thing was it went on to details like if you were for example from a particular state and if you liked, if you had liked orange Nike sneakers, there was, they could figure out to that, they had built their algorithm so smartly uh, with the, and combining, so if you had, were from a particular state and you liked orange Nike shoes, and if they combine that with a little bit of your personal profile, they could, they could predict that what party are you going to imply towards. No relation right now in terms of political affiliation, right? Particular state, orange Nike shoes, figure that out. Right? And they targeted ads and they got users that way. Right? There was a lot of influencing then. But that's where it starts coming. Who shared that information? All that personal information when you created a profile on Facebook, that is your information that you gave access to Facebook, right? The next thing that happened is, remember how on Facebook feeds you see um, take this quiz or something and there are times when we get too excited and oh, I want to be, I want to show how smart I am and I'll do that. When you do that, that app actually gets your personal information, right? So, and those quizzes, what's the capital of a certain country or the flag of a certain state, it does not matter, take your pick, those kind of quizzes. So now they could also, the second level that they did was, yes, one level was orange Nike shoes, particular state. The second level was, if you had taken this particular quiz, and if you had, out of the 10 answers, if you had questions 2, 4, 6, 8, right, I could actually tell that you, your inclination is towards a, a particular party now. And it was easy to catch people because we all get trapped in those things. Mm -hmm. And your personal information is just flowing through. It went on to that partner company, right? And from that partner company went on to Cambridge Analytica. They had access to, again, millions of uh, data points that helped them get to this level. That brings us to the point of, hey, where's the transparency? Where, where was the ethics in communication or ethics in storing data with Facebook, right? When I created my user profile, I shared my data. Where was the ethics here, right? Um, 
the, I'll bring you to the next level. We all share pictures on Facebook. Uh, when I say we, I think your generation does it way more than we do. But do you really know what's happening? Where are those pictures going on? You don't know? Yes. Cloud storage? Uh, they're going to cloud storage and technically Facebook is yeah. saying, telling you that, hey, it's only stored in the Facebook stream. How much are you guaranteed that two years down the line, another thing like Cambridge Analytica is not coming up with pictures? Right? So, and that all comes back, it's a two-way sword. Yes, as a customer, I'm trusting Facebook, but Facebook has not been transparent to me about that. Yes. Um, I think if if in if Facebook cannot collect data, Facebook would the Facebook fa Facebook's business model is based on that. Yes. It won't. It will never exist. The only thing that makes Facebook more uh, better at at uh, at ads is targeting ads. And if you cannot have that information, you won't be able to target. And therefore, as a company, I will not f pay Facebook more than paying X or Y or Z company. So uh, I don't know if 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 we ever go into that case that where is the ethics in, in, in terms of Facebook, Facebook will never exist. It's gone. I agree. I mean, Facebook exists because of targeted ads and it, that is its business. I think the whole world, the rest of the world has been questioning, okay, you are, you are in that business of collecting data, but there is, when we have a communication, I'm sending you some information, there is a, a an agreement that that information, my information is with you and you're agreeing that you have my information. Mm -hmm. I've not given you the right to just let mm -hmm. it go on to five other people. Yeah. And that actually brings into ethics, mm -hmm. hey, when that actually breaks the communication pipeline right there, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and that was what went into question over there, right? Same thing happened with Google Plus. Do you know Google Plus? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just came up yeah. last yeah. week, right? Yeah. 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 Google Plus was another thing, Google Plus shut down, right? I actually pulled up a video from uh, Wall Street just to show you if you are a Google Plus video, what should you be doing? Google is shutting down the consumer version of its Google Plus social network after the journal revealed that it had exposed the data of hundreds of thousands of users. You might be wondering, what was Google Plus again? And am I affected by this situation? Good questions. Google launched the social network in 2011, but it never really took off. Still, there was a stretch where Google actually required users to sign up for a Google Plus account in order to do other things, like post on YouTube. So you might have an account without realizing it. The company discovered a software glitch in March that made it so outside developers could have accessed information from user profiles that were set to private. Information like full name, birthday, email address, gender, places you've lived, and occupation, but not phone numbers, timeline posts, or direct messages. The company says it fixed the bug and that there's no evidence that anyone got their hands on this data or misused it. But it also didn't disclose the issue to its users because it wanted to avoid the kind of public scrutiny that Facebook got after its Cambridge Analytica scandal. Even though the company is planning to shut down the product for all but enterprise customers over the next 10 months, you shouldn't leave a dormant account lying around with your personal information in it. So here's how you delete it. First, check if you have an account, even if you think there's absolutely no way. Log into any Gmail accounts you have and click on the little circle where your profile picture is. No pick? Look for the first letter of your name. Next, look to see if there's a link that says Google Plus Profile. If there is, that means you have an account. Click on it and that should open your profile. From there, click on Settings and scroll down to the bottom where it says Delete your Google Plus Profile. By deleting, you're getting rid of any data you have in there, so check the box saying you understand that this move can't be undone. Then click Delete. You're done! Interesting, you know, I do a course with, uh, in collaboration with Google here, which is an intro to programming course, right? Uh, what we had last last time as faculty, all of us were on um, Google Plus. It's run, uh, it's run, being run as a pilot across colleges in the US. Last time we were all, fac all faculty, last semester we were all on Google Plus discussion forums. This semester we are on a different, um, uh, different technology platform for our group discussions. So interesting. But uh, again, it, it just brings up, they knew about it in March, we knew about it in October. That too when WSJ Wall Street Journal brought, brought it up. So that again brings up um, the ethics when you, 
and as communications uh, professionals, I think that's something that you've got to hammer into your company because the people who are doing data are doing, a lot of times the people who are doing data, they are not building up that into their profile, right? They're just in the business of, oh, I want to get more data, more data, more data. But where you can be a showstopper is you can say, hey, let's wait a minute. Let's talk about ethics and transparency here. And let's build up, let's talk about building a real trust here, right? And that's where your communications plan should come in. What's our media plan? How do, how do we plan to be um, transparent with the customers? How do we plan to use different social media? Because again, how you use different social media is also different in terms of your uh, PR strategy, right? How your PR uh, department uses, like for example, how you use your Instagram versus Twitter versus a Facebook feed versus a LinkedIn is all different social media platforms are used very differently. What is really core as communications professionals for you is to understand the depth of each of these social media platforms. Each one of them are not identical. They should not. They should not be used in the same way. What you post on your Facebook, don't start posting an exact thing on your LinkedIn. It's two different types of audience. It's two different types of ways in which people absorb. Right. So understand what's your strategy over there, and make sure that how you communicate across different social media platforms is different. A big thing that also goes in is word of mouth. Yes, I know we live in a world where we are not seeing each other a lot more in person than we actually wanted to. But still, word of mouth does matter a lot. Here's how word of mouth work, works. Um, um, I use a social media a texting platform called WhatsApp a lot. Um, those of us who come from outside the US or who have families outside the US, that's a very popular social media uh, platform. So it could be nowadays WhatsApp, uh, it could be that you have a channel, texting channel going on and you start spreading out something like word of mouth. But understand how your audience behaves, right? In what geography are they behaving? What, what's their behavior? It's very important to understand that. The most important thing is you should start picking up cues based on your reviews that you get, right? If you put in a post on Facebook and you're getting some reviews, read through those reviews they will start telling you a story, underlying story right there. Is there something going wrong out there? If you put in a LinkedIn post, one of your leaders has put in a, put in a LinkedIn post, start reading through comments. There, there's a few things that you can start figuring out. Who are the people who are actually communicating on that responses? Who are the kind of, where is my audience coming from? Nowadays, there are easy analytical tools to figure out where does my audience come from, geography, demographics, all that stuff you can easily figure out. But understand where your audience is coming from, what kind of story is being built up in the comments itself. Because that helps you build the trust. You can catch that light. Somebody, some uh, you know, nervous customer might start putting something on one platform. Before you know, I might have copied it from LinkedIn, posted it, oh, you know what? XYZ company put some post and oh somebody people people are generally saying that it's a data breach I would I'll put that up on my Facebook feed before you know I'll have a million likes or shares on Facebook and it was just a wrong messaging out there so it's very important for communications people and PR people to be on top of this data because that's a different level of data that's coming at you at your company right and you've got to stop it or understand that volume of data as well. Different levels of trust, um, shared values, what do you share as a company? What's your integrity? How do you maintain integrity? I think these are standard ones. How do you uh, establish a concern for others? Stay competent, competent in this market and still be accountable. Accountability is something that actually comes big which is how do I make someone accountable for good or bad? Right? Or hold myself accountable for something good or bad? Um, a key thing, a few key things before we actually dive into some use cases. In, in the world of big data, what's really important is kind of a cycle, if you will, um, which is explore and engage. On the explore side, you've got to have 
be able to integrate and understand all of these different media, right? If you see from social to mobile to website to email or we still have mail responses, some people still do that, to how's the purchasing going on, what kind of cards. Once you do that, you start figuring, figuring out, sorry, whose uh, who's likelihood who, what likelihood does what kind of person have towards purchasing my data? You start establishing profiles, right? And how do I get them, how, how do I get to understand my customer behavior? And at the end of the day, you're worrying more about segmentation out here, which is how do I split my audience into different segments? Because in terms of communication, I need to address them differently, right? It comes back to how much volume of data do we get in one day. Uh, what Again, connecting it back to there are certain users that watch video. There are certain video users that will keep looking at my Facebook feed. There are certain users that love emails. You have three different types of data. Those are three different data types. right? There's videos, there's Facebook posts, and there's emails. What happens is you get all of that data into your company. The first step that you need to do is how do I mix all of them to even figure out what, what is the underlying story across all of these different media types that's happening. Right? And that's, again, that's the complexity of big data. At the end of the day, how do you engage and send the message, right message in the right channel? right? And you've got to execute and deliver. Um, I've got one more video to show you. Uh, this is from McKinsey. The subject of data culture comes up a lot in, in conferences and places. And I, I find it interesting because culture itself is a bit of an ethereal term uh, and it's hard to nail down. So I always think about it in corporate terms in, in three areas. What do you demand? What do you expect? And what will you accept? So when it comes to data, we, we kind of think about it that way. What are things we demand be true about our data and how we treat it and how we consume it? So for example, we take PII very seriously. We demand that you, it's a written rule. This is what you can and can't do. And we have policies that are allowed and things that are not allowed. And going against those policies will probably end up in you losing your job. Um, there are expectations that if I do get the data, I treat it effectively. And if I transform it, um, or I move it, or I land it, it's in a place where most people can get to it with the controls in place. And then there's what we accept. Right? We accept people going in and playing with the data. Taking five days, trying something up, what did we learn and not learn? That won't get you fired, it won't, it's not a written thing, it's just something we expect you to do, and we're okay if, if not everything pans out. And I think that's what a data culture starts to be about. This, this article, which is really nice, why data culture matters, I think it's so important nowadays to, when you start looking at building a culture of data in the company, like uh, the leader there said, it's PII. You've got to understand and appreciate the personal, the importance of personal information there. Right? And why it's so valuable, it is valuable, but at the same time, it is so uh, sensitive information, you can't just send it around with anyone. You've got to, as a communications professional, I think one of the biggest jobs today in today's world that communications people can do across, within the company, at, within the company first, is to establish that culture of data, that hey, we've got to understand there are some ground rules. Because I'll be honest, as a techie, you know, we get excited uh, when we see data. Oh, there's this thing I can do. Oh, there's the, that, that data set I can build, that report I can do. I can do 10 different things with it. But is it ethical? Should I be doing that stuff, all of that stuff? And that's the culture that I think as communications professionals, you can really establish within the company. Because that eventually also starts sending, sending out a message to the outside world what your company is all about. Right. Um, I wanted to just use a use case before we go into the, I left the technical part for the end, so I thought I, I would not scare you all away from uh, running from the truth. <laughs> um, the use case I thought interesting was 
Amazon, as much as we all love Amazon and we are making Jeff Bezos richer by the minute here, Amazon is watching you every single minute, right? Across devices, whatever you do. Um, predictive analytics, we'll talk about it. They can predict almost everything that you do or they'll be able to predict a lot of what we can do in the near future. They have a personalized recommendation system. They know between the family, between the devices, who's doing what. So they, they know what are you buying, what did you buy, think of buying but did not buy. And now I can start figuring, go, going into a lot of details. We've all seen the book re recommendations. So yeah, they've got all of that in place. One click ordering, as much as fun it sounds and oh, it's easy for me to go and I think the new Z generation does a lot of one-click ordering. I think our generation is still <laughs> a little less. We are yes. backwards and I don't do one-click. I'm scared. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I think once it's enabled, it's like go, go, go. And I'm, I'm too scared. No, I'm too scared. I'm too scared. I'm scared I'll make like an instant purchase and I regret it. Yeah. But what they are trying to get you into is um, that instant behavior so that you don't have time to think but they'll get all of that data and they have a lot of time to think on their hands about what should be your next move, how can you make Jeff Bezos much more rich at that, right? Yes? Well, the one-click ordering, even though it's not Amazon anymore because their patent just ran out, yeah. now it's going to be everywhere. So any store you can go is going to be one-click yeah. purchase. Yes, so which, which is interesting. Now we are expanding that into a lot of zones there, right? Anticipatory shipping model, they pretty much yes. know for what products. Uh, here's, I think what they do is a very smart thing. Because they know what kind of products we are buying, what kind of people we are, they kind of know which products I should put in on a two-day shipping, which products I don't put in on a two-day shipping and you'll still be fine. So they know a lot of, uh, lot about our behavior, what, are doing, what we are doing in the day-to-day -day lives. Yes, we can talk about supply chain optimization. It helps them optimize their supply chain to the limits and very efficiently. They do price optimization. Um, I'm sure a lot of us have seen, if you go back to the same product four times a day, on the fifth time, the price would increase. Right? On the same product, same oh, yeah. exact product, you keep wow. clicking, 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 oh, yeah. and they just increase the price. And it's like, what just happened here? Well, they have all the price optimization uh, models. <laughs> Um, and I had a cousin who, was, who used to work with Jet.com, which is mm -hmm. Walmart's edition. Walmart they took over Jet and that's, they're trying to be competitor. And he was one of the team members of the price optimization and he was said, saying that was crazy. They almost look at what Amazon does and they were just imitating that. And these programmers can look at from outside. They don't look at the Amazon code, but they look at that and they cheat with their models. Yes. Does that not happen often though, that other companies copy like the best uh, thing to do? Like uh, Walmart copying, or like anyone copying the one click, that kind of stuff? It, yeah, everybody's copying everyone nowadays. It's, it's like, yes, no more that does Amazon technically, in terms of technology, I don't know if Amazon holds that uh, leverage, but it's just that the sheer volume that it has, it's just holding that leverage across every one of us. Uh, but more important, if you look at all of these between personalized recommendations, book re recommendation, one-click ordering, it has a uh, Amazon does hold a lot of our personal information, right? And what they can do is, as partners, they can share that information across, right? Let's go back to this article here. Uh, shared with the company and partners, right? They share that information with the partners. These people did share it with the partners. These people are telling us right now, well, we don't believe that it was taken by any other company. Who knows? I mean, after what has happened with Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, as a consumer, I'm not ready to trust that that information did not go out to some other few folks. Now, Amazon, again, let's go back to Amazon. They have all of that information. Yes, they can do a lot of interesting things with my data, but what's really stopping them from sending that data or selling that data to some other folks out there? They sure are selling that data, you know, because you do see ads on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so they are selling that data. Right? Again, it gets in. Uh, what gets interesting is nowadays with all the social media, all companies have 360 degree view of customers. When we take, when we think of companies, I want you to think of not just Amazon that we are talking about here. It could be any site. Think of CNN. Think of a news site. Right? Pull up a news site. Uh, think of CNN. Think of football fan, NFL.com, mm -hmm. uh, but pull up any site that you want. They have a 360 degree view of your of you. The reason is because you're accessing it on your iPad, you're accessing it on your phone, you're accessing it on your laptop, so you're liking it on Facebook, you're going on Twitter and you're retweeting them. They've got a lot of information. The reason they have a 360 degree view at a different level as well is I'll explain you how Facebook like also works in terms of additional data, right? Um, so I've liked one face, uh, one post. Let's say I've liked one post on Facebook. Okay, what happens is Facebook can say, okay, uh, Maithili Arande liked this post. What else does Maithili Arande like? Okay. So now Facebook knows five other things or ten other things that I like. Okay, okay, that's interesting. She likes this and she likes ten other things. I know her interest. Well, who else likes this? The same thing that Maithili Irande like, right? If I liked, um, let's say, blue coats or uh, whatever, Ralph Lauren. I like Ralph Lauren. Who else, similar to my profile, likes Ralph Lauren, right? Do those people also like at least 8 out of the 10 other things that I like? Is there a connectivity here? So they are trying to build a network here, right? Then that's one level. Then we start going to the next level. Oh, by the way, who is Maithili friends with? We create our own groups and we like, I like my business school. Um, uh, if, I'm sure Eric, if you're on Facebook, you'll like Harvard. So. Uh, He's on Harvard, he's liking Harvard, but now I'm starting to see, okay, if Maithili likes INSEAD, who else is Maithili friends with? Do they like INSEAD? Have they been to INSEAD? What else, if they've not been to INSEAD, what do they like that helps them connect back to her? I'm building a total network just using one person, and it can go down to five, six different levels. I was reading an article in the morning um, which was back in the day, I think this was 18th century when one of the researchers, what they had done was taken a package and sent to Kansas City, like absolute Midwest, and seen how much time or how many times does it exchange hands to get to say Massachusetts or on the East Coast. Turns out it was on an average, um, that package took six exchanges with, before it came to came to the East Coast, came back to the East Coast, right? So we, they pretty much, that research came out that on an average you have six levels, six degrees between the network, right? Um, okay, that was interesting back in the day. Nowadays with that kind of network that we've built in, it's much more deeper than the six degrees that we've initially thought of, right? Six degrees deeper, but we are not talking. We can also talk about how much wider am I going, right? And I'm also liking something on LinkedIn. So now my LinkedIn profile can start connecting with my Facebook profile. I can again come in at a different level. So the amount of information just by your name, last name, email, basic information that goes in, it gets very interesting. Um, I think this is a fascinating time for communications as a whole to figure out that network with these through these companies. You can share that data. These companies are sharing that data with you as communications professionals. I think it's a totally fascinating time for you to figure out, hey, that's the level of network I'm getting. Imagine the level of depth and access that you can reach out to, right? Just going on to the amount of data that we have. From the dawn of civilization until 2003, we generate only five exabytes of data. Now we do that every two days. It's actually increased. It's about seven or eight every two days. So the amount of data that's there in the world, there's no dearth of data that is, that is there in the world. Uh, I have a quick question regarding it. If you're a, a company, and there's a lot of, a lot of data that 
there is not enough people to to analyze it. Yes. Now, for a small company, if you want to, what is the best way is for you to to uh, calculate your own data regarding your own customers, or would you prefer purchasing the data from from other companies and and analyze that data? Which would you recommend in that on that aspect? That's a great, fantastic question. Um, I think at the first level, what you do is if you have your own website and you have your mobile app, right? There are simple tools like, for example, Google Analytics. You can just plug into that and you'll start getting a ton of data just for you, between your sites and your subsidiaries, mm -hmm. right? You start getting that data, and we've seen that um, do with Sesame. When I worked with Sesame, we did that. We let them first access just their level of data. Like, okay, let's plug in Google Analytics. Let's start getting the ton of information that you have, which includes like, when did my daughter's pause and play? and which I can get into details with voiceover as in what kind of voice modulation of Elmo do, does an average four-year-old like versus a three-year-old and you can change that and then what segment what does Elmo talk and they like or do they like Big Bird talking that segment and once we had that data um, they were doing a few different things in terms of communications, messaging that they were sending out, if they had to put out an ad, they made sure if it was for a particular subject, Elmo was talking or Big Bird was talking, but on, then they took that same data, went to their programming, which is the content development team, and they said, hey, looks like if you're talking numbers, Elmo is, or Big Bird is not the right person to do, this other character is the right person to do. So that was just by using plain simple Google Analytics data. We hadn't even gotten into a different level of detail. Um, at the next level, when we started getting mature with that analysis, what we did with Sesame was, um, you know, when you air the shows on the TV, we get all, they can, all of these networks get all of the information from the TV, um, TVs as well, right? Um, so they had data about who was playing what kind of episode and all of that stuff again from on the TV side, right? We married that data with what we were going with Google Analytics. Now we were going across devices and geographies to figure out, okay, if you're watching on TV, you probably like that segment to be said by Elmo, but if you're watching it on your iPad, you don't like Elmo to say those things. You want Big Bird or Ernie or Bird to say those things. So that was the level of data that they were getting on. But that's how we kind of graduated, that take your own data, be small, be nimble, make sure you polish it nicely, are able to analyze it, let's get on to the next level. And then in the, uh, at the third level was we started getting their financial data, right? Revenues, uh, with what, is, what show is selling more, what show is not selling more. We started marrying that data across devices, across everything. And now we were able to go to the sponsors or if we had to pay someone for a voiceover, we as in if Sesame had to pay, they could. St they were starting to deal in terms of contracts. Who should I pay more, who should I pay less? So it's, it's pretty interesting. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So it's amazing level of detail that we can go to. Uh, last few side slides, I thought I'll introduce you into what actually, we, we talk about big data, what actually is big data when we keep talking about big data, right? We saw all of that there. We saw about all of this data here. If you look at this data here, a lot of them are very different. What you do on Twitter is 120 characters, small things. YouTube is all videos. You have, um, you have Netflix again, which is real content that's flowing in. There are emails. We are not even talking about emails. Facebook posts are different. So just for one company that's going across these different channels, right? If you're going on Facebook versus a YouTube versus an Instagram or Amazon, you're going across different types of media right there, right? And we, we can talk about emails and the flyers and all that stuff that goes on. When we look at all of that, what happens? There are four V's of big data. That's the core of big data that we say. One is volume. It's the data at scale. Like we saw, so much of data keeps coming at us all the time. The challenge for organizations when we think big data is how do I take all of that big data, get it together, and be able to analyze it. Right? 
this volume of data and I need to just access or harness it. Variety is the second one which is data in many forms. S sorry, yes. Oh, uh, I have another question. Okay, okay. Uh, thanks. Um, data, variety is data in many forms. When we say data in many forms, we call it in tech language, we call it a structured and unstructured data, right? When you think structured, think, if you've not dealt with structured data, think Excel, right? Mm -hmm. How you, in Excel, you have everything in rows and columns, right? If I had to, for example, at a very simple way, if I just had to put in student scores in Excel, I would have one column with the student names, let's say the second column is test score, right? But in the column that has test scores, there's only test scores, which is only numbers. I don't put any alphabets in there, right? And in the column that is student names, there's only names. I'm not putting a video in there or an email address, it's only names. So that is called structured data, which is I've formatted my data. I've defined what are my columns. If it is revenue, it's, if it's dollars, that column will only have dollars. If it's numbers, numbers. So it's all structure, right? Unstructured data is everything else that we are talking about now, which is emails. The way you write an email or you send an email is different. I would embed a few other things in the email. So email is an unstructured data. Videos, right? Your Twitter feeds, Instagrams, Facebook, LinkedIn, everything is unstructured. It is called unstructured because there's no format to it. There's no limit that the videos will always be only five minutes, right? There is no format to images. We have different types of images. And now the challenge becomes, how do I get all of these different types of data from images to videos to text to a structured also, which is revenue data, how do I get that together and start processing it um, in? The third one is velocity, very important. It is analysis of streaming data, right? My data keeps moving here. Videos, emails, these are flowing, tweets, all of these are flowing, they just don't stop. So I've got that aspect. The last is veracity, which is interesting for most of the leaders, which is uncertainty of data. How do I trust the quality of data? Right? Just because you say that my, my company is not a great company does not mean that it's not a great company. But how do I trust that quality of data coming in from someone? And that is why where again a communication strategy, having a stronger PR does make a difference. You, how do you send that messaging out, in, have your integrity in place, right? Uh, three different types of analytics that we do, descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive. Descriptive is always looking into the past, what happened to me in the last five months, 10 months, or a year, right? That's telling me all my past information. Predictive is always getting into future. How you do, you cannot do one without having done the other. Descriptive is absolutely the first stepping stone. You've got to be able to analyze your past perfectly because what you do is you step, you use your past data and you start modeling it, start, start figuring out samples from it to see can you predict future from that data. So the past becomes very important. Yes. So now that uh, live streaming has become like a good media, uh, like uh, websites like Twitch, yeah. can you perform this uh, like step process over the course of a live stream, you don't have like not. I'm not talking like live stream to live stream. I'm talking in the few minutes or hours that you are currently live streaming. Can you find out uh, what's working uh, and like adapt upon it? And have you performed any of that during? Have you worked with live streaming? Yes, to both. Um, have done that. Uh, yes, most of the organizations that are live streaming, Netflix would be an example. They would be doing it. I worked with a small um, startup in Midtown, Manhattan. They were having uh, similar to net, not similar to Netflix, but uh, they were um, launching these. You know, um, I'm losing these. Uh, this thing, the classic movies and all that stuff. Uh, so they had that their site where they were hosting all of these old expired deals. You know, content. We always have movie makers have deals. But once you have MGM has a 50, 60 year old movie, which is not a great hit, they're ready to give it off to a smaller shop. So these people would buy that smaller, uh, uh, that, that content for cheap and they wanted to live stream it, right? like a subscription model. 
uh, but then we built what we built on back of that uh, as a backbone to their entire site was within uh, one minute of live streaming we were we like if you were that company you would be able to start seeing the uh, analytics into it like who's watching what where where are you pausing where did you start how much time did it take between for for you to pause and start and everything in between uh, that's pretty much a uh, standard procedure now we're doing that most of the companies do that um, so we predict into the future what could happen. The last is what I call the final frontier, which is prescriptive analytics. Okay, I know what's going to happen in the future. Can someone help me? What should I do about it now? Mm -hmm. Right. When in my career, when I've spoken with uh, companies, everybody starts with all the leadership starts with, hey, I want to do prescriptive analytics. Oh, good. Are you doing descriptive? No, not really. But let's just get to prescriptive. Well, here's the fun part of it. You can't get to it unless you've done this. Mm -hmm. right? Because I don't know what you're doing in the past, so I can't build any model to predict the future, mm -hmm. and I can't tell you how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. So that's very few of the companies are getting onto that program. Yes. And um, how would you recommend that communication folks learn from the traditional, you know what I mean? Like if there's a conversation on social media, so you said, look at the comments to tell a story, right? So let's say, a company puts out some content on social media and people aren't really a fan of it, they tweak the message a little bit, they are a fan. How does that play into messaging for a communication team? Um, so what typically companies do is you take that social media, um, what has happened in the past, you take similar posts. So what we also have is, um, um, I'm just trying to think of the word. Um, it's the word for feeling or um, sentiment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So sentiment analysis. So I go into social media. We can do a past analysis on sentiment analysis. And then we start picking up similar social media feeds. And you know, once we've start, started doing the past, I can predict for a similar sen sentiment, for a similar feed, what would be the sentiment. So I can predict that. And now if your sentiment is going to be one way or the other, what should I do about it? Then as we are, you are trained into that, okay, if that's the sentiment, if the, your data team comes and tells you, well, beware, if you do this kind of tweet, you're going to get this kind of sentiment. You're the PR specialist, you will actually tell them, hey, let's get to this now. And then I can build that into the model, which is my prescriptive. So next time what happens is it's automated now. Mm -hmm. um, based on a particular sentiment, based on a particular feed, my models can start learning from that and they will advise me. Yes? Um, a quick question regarding, uh, for example, in the case of Twitter, uh, when you think about the data collection, there is always a, a difference between the person who, who is behind the, the, who is entering the, the, like, a person would be on Twitter very different than they are in real life. Yes. And in the case of Twitter specifically, um, how are, is, how are you as a marketer being able to get, because you don't, there is not a lot of feedback from the, from the, uh, from the, from the, uh, from the tweeter, except the, the, the ways they, they, they write and probably their search history and what, what they're interested in. Now, how can I get good, valuable data for, as a, as a marketer from that specific segment? Because it's, I can see who they are on Twitter, but in real, I can get that, m m that information, I try to sell them something, but in real life, they are something very different than what they are on, on Twitter. Okay. And this is an, an issue usually for when you are trying to sell products or trying to market specifically Twitter and, and things like that. How, as a, a, a data analyst, how would, can you get good data from that specific model? Oh, great question. That is one of the challenges that companies do face, that sometimes people are not what they are in the online and the real space, right? Um, here's one of the ways that companies are trying to work around that is by using the networking effect, saying, okay, you're tweeting one level, let me just, can I figure out who your network is? You know, like, who else are you following? Who else are you friends with? All that stuff. That will tell me a lot more about you than your tweets, right? That's one level. And then uh, there are ways when they can take a similar profile a similar profiler, not necessarily they will know exactly who you are, but I can take a similar profile, I would have my profile data extract out of Facebook as well, 
or mm. LinkedIn or some other social media platform and then I can start figuring out if these are the kind of networks that this person is connected with, right? These are the chains that they have. Um, are there sim and for a similar profile, are there similar chains on Facebook or some other social media platform? And then I can go into a LinkedIn and say, hey, are there similar connectivities here? Uh, so if I start doing that, plus my my own company databases where I am emailing a lot of people, you know, the email marketing and all that stuff goes on. I can extract value out of that saying, is there, are there similarities in here in terms of consumer behavior that I'm seeing? And they use that. But yeah, you're right, There's, that is a challenge. How do I figure out the real person? One way they do that is connect across sources and see what's happening. Um, a quick look into one of the predictive analytics, um, not necessarily communication, but a lot of police departments, Boston Police is doing that. They have analysts who actually pick up the data and they can start predicting which region will have what kind of crime, what time of the day. That's crime analytics. If I can predict that, I would have deployed cops already over there. And the other thing is, I only have a limited type of trained cops over there, right? So not all cops are trained or efficient in any, every single type of crime. But if I can narrow this down, I can have specific cops there. Uh, I can start at least using my workforce much better. One of the ways predictive analytics is used. Prescriptives, again, set of suggestions, what you can do. It is not to say that if I've got prescriptive, you know, I know, okay, my models are telling me if you had a particular kind of tweet, this is the set sentiment you will get and that's particular, that's the specific action you should take. It's just augmenting human judgment. The human judgment part will, should not go away. If as a company you make a decision that, hey, I've got my prescriptive analytics up, unto prescri uh, up into prescriptive analytics, everything is in flow and I should back out, I think people are making, companies are making a mistake. PR, uh, PR professionals, communication professionals, expertise should come in at that point of time. Um, what should we do? Again, where do you invest? What do you do at every single point of your life? That's what you want, prescriptive analytics. Um, I want to end it by connecting you back again with where we started. This is different sources of data. You have, as a company, you have so many, such a vast amount of and variety of data. The key here is, I always advise uh, clients, start small, figure out what is it that you can easily manage in what, you can, what you're doing right now, and then keep adding sources. You can mm -hmm. always plug in additional sources as you go along, and that is always a good strategy to go on. Because if you start with, hey, I'll go with big data, I'll go video, emails, everything in one shot, you're going to fail royally. Uh, it's better to go with a much more manageable data and start small, start adding data. Because un unless you do that, you won't be generating actionable insights. That's what uh, big data is to me. Thank you. Thoughts? Yes. So when you first talked about uh, voice modulations that are taken by Siri, um, Alexa, etc. So by the time they could recognize like your voice tone and stuff, would they be able to access because they have like the, the feature of those uh, of those apps or can be used while the phone is kind of off or you're not using the phone itself? So would they have the access to them if they already have the recognition of your voice? Yes, they have um, access to your data as soon as they start hearing your voice as well. A lot of companies are doing that. I'll give you a different example, but it'll connect back um, on a customer, so customer call center, right? Uh, one of the banks, uh, a lot of the banks are doing it now, but I'll give you one particular example. Uh, they had their call center in the on the west coast uh, for these high net worth individuals, right? And high net worth individuals don't have a lot of patients. You want to cater to them specifically. What they eventually figured out, they developed a voice modulation system such that the moment customer called in, right, uh, someone picked up the phone within the first ten seconds, 
So by the time the customer is saying, hi, I'm so and so, and you are saying, oh, hello, Mr. So and so, how are you doing? In those 10 seconds, all of that customer's data would was pulled up and it was displayed on the uh, person's screen. To the, the data part is fine, you know, using voice and I'm saying that's, that's the easy part. But they were also go, able to go a couple of levels deep into sentiment analysis. Mm. And they were able to project onto the call center experts the screen. This, is an, this customer is not in a good mood right now. And that was, they were using a lot of data from the past, from the past as in maybe a couple of days where they, they, that customer had interactions with the bank at some point of time. And they were looking at the transactions that were happen, happening with that customer. They were looking at a lot of things, plus add, add to it the natural language processing and the voice modulation because that tells them, hey, looks like this customer is not happy. So immediately what would happen is they would know uh, if that call needs to be routed to a specialist who takes care of an upset customer or it's a normal customer, you can keep conti you continue to talk. So they they do that. They, like within a few seconds, they can pull up everything about you. Yes? Within like the, se the same realm as his question, mm -hmm. if we were to take like preventative uh, measures <laughs> like turning off Siri on our phones, do you think then our data could be saved or like not using voice automated things like Alexa or like Google Home and stuff, would we be safe? <laughs> <laughs> the short answer is no. Um, I don't think, the, the short, the, here's the thing, once you've done any transaction online, you're in, okay? Um, after that, it's just about how much you can control what's going out from you. Uh, like I know a lot of people include, which includes me, like we don't post pictures of our kids online nowadays. I'm very careful about doing that, um, especially after everything that are happening. Or not on Facebook. I wouldn't uh, do that. Can I still prevent privacy theft? I don't think so. That's not going to happen. I Google Plus. Uh, even I had a Google Google Plus. Um, right when the um, Experian or which data one of the credit card companies got hacked. Um, yes, you get hacked. So that part. Once you have a transaction online. It's, you can prevent it, a few things that you can do as privacy is, um, you know, like a lot of times people, there are people who are very uh, skeptical when you go to a public Wi-Fi and you're just doing all trans sorts of transactions on a public free Wi-Fi. So that's where, that's your most uh, susceptible to getting hacked, right? Um, if you have Bluetooth on, most of the times, like I never keep my Bluetooth on unless I need it. Um, but those are the little things that you can prevent to just have with, uh, like free, give, give away your data as a freebie. That's the only thing that you're preventing. But other than that, if you've shopped Amazon, you've already gotten there. Right? And I can go into, that's a different discussion because I uh, do do cyber security and hacks. So yes, we can get into that level of conversation and, uh, as well. Yes. Uh, just a doesn't Amazon or, or Alexa or, or uh, Siri, they only collect data after, or at least that's what they, what they say, and that's why I'm asking. They say they don't only collect data when the, when the activation word is, is or the wake up word is set. For example, when you say Alexa, then they, started coll then they start collecting data. So technically, they don't collect data while you're speaking and you don't say the active word. Is that true? Technically, it should be true. Um, that's what they tell us. Um, here's reason to believe it. I think it was about five, six months ago, there was an article where uh, conversations in a household between a husband and a wife went over, got sent to a friend and they were actually uh, talking bad things or not liking about that friend. Uh, that, at that point, they were not activating the device. So yes, they tell us that you it should, it works only when I'm calling out Alexa and then saying that. But um, again, it's a factor of trust. Has Amazon, here's my question, has Amazon done enough to put that trust that you're sure that, okay, if I say Alexa only, then it's getting activated. Mm -hmm. I personally don't think, I've, I've not seen that much going on from Amazon. Mm -hmm. We as a consumers, however, have bought into that wave and we've all went on and bought uh, Alexa. And Amazon, now Amazon is fine. Hey, we've sold millions of these things, which means 
it's a networking effect, right? Ten of us in this room trust Alexa, so who am I to question? I also trust Alexa without question. Mm -hmm. I have a quick question. Yes. You shared a really interesting example about how all this data can be used for positive, yes. um, for a positive outcome like the crime um, analytics. Um, are there any other types of applications that you can think of that big data is helping our society? Again, but that said, I do appreciate all the extremely important concerns that you that you raised. Um, yes, a lot of different ways. I mean. If you are looking for social um, uh, work as well, mm -hmm. a lot of the environmental stuff does get uh, through big data. Mm -hmm. Because now you are knowing temperatures of the cities versus there are times when the environmental protection agency is tracking number of trees and they use all of all sorts of different mm -hmm. data, data to actually gather insights and say what else, what should we be doing. Mm -hmm. And that actually funnels into research. Mm -hmm. uh, on what should we be doing to reduce the temperatures that are rising so fast. Mm -hmm. So that's on a good cause, yes. Um, there's a lot of data that governments across the states and cities and countries are using. So I have, for example, a lot of employment data. I have a lot of things that people are doing as a city. You know, if I'm subscribed to that city's site, I can see what are the discussions on social media going on. Mm -hmm. Most of the towns have their own town-wide Facebook uh, groups now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so they can, if we realistically think, you can start collecting those uh, posts. Mm -hmm. You can, yes, there's a lot of effort because there's a lot of times there's only casual conversations going mm -hmm. on. But you can still figure out a lot of important data in terms of employment, um, transportation, um, sanitation, and a lot of other issues. And now you can marry them to funding that's coming through to the state, to uh -huh. the city. So they are doing using a lot of this data to do some real good work uh -huh. as well. Uh, so that's on the social side of it, you yeah. know, how economics, it's not just uh, these retailers, the big retailers that are using, but uh, police department again, yes, but governments are using it. Um, environmental mm -hmm. protection agencies have big data sets going on into them as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, a lot of work. I mean, sports, of course, sports teams do a lot of analytics as well. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, folks, thank you so much once again. Thank you. Thank you.